Good evening. This is the Don't Shoot Town Hall meeting on 89.9 HD1 WCBU Peoria Public Radio. I'm Tanya Kuntz. We're coming to you live from room 400 at Peoria City Hall. You can see and hear a live stream of this broadcast at peoriapublicradio.org. The Don't Shoot program in the city of Peoria has received national attention. It was unveiled last August. The Don't Shoot collaboration has just completed the second call-in of target offenders. That includes the people the program is targeted at getting to lay down their guns. The Don't Shoot collaboration includes Peoria Mayor Jim Artis, Peoria Police Chief Steve Settingsguard, Peoria County State's Attorney Jerry Brady, Peoria County Sheriff Mike McCoy, and U.S. District Attorney Jim Lewis, as well as Krista Coleman, the community coordinator for the program. She works out of the Peoria Police Department. Each of the Don't Shoot team members is here tonight, uh, including Carl Cannon. That is with the exception of Sheriff Mike McCoy, who had a previous commitment. Nate Terry is also with us as a panelist this evening. Terry is a person who can speak to what it means to turn one's life around. Thank you each for taking the time to do this. Our media panel for this occasion is Peoria Journal Star City Hall reporter Nick Vlahos and WEEK WHOI reporter Marshanna Hester. Uh, thank you both for taking the time to be here. The Don't Shoot Town Hall meeting opens with media questions. Each, with each question asked, the reporters will be allowed follow-up questions. The reporter question series will be followed by your questions. Audience members can write out questions on the note cards provided here in the City Council Chambers, or you can send them to our WCBU Facebook page. You can tweet us at WCBU Radio. We can also take your questions via email at WCBUNews at FSMail, that stands for Faculty Staff Mail, at bradley.edu. You can also tweet questions to our media panelist, Nick Blahos, at Blahos Nick. We'll begin with questions. Our first question is, what are the lessons learned in the first 15 months of this program? Because there are seven of you at this table and we are doing this live broadcast, uh, please let me know kind of indicate to me which one of you will be speaking first, which one of you will be speaking next. We will say your name so our audience can recognize who's speaking at the time. <laughs> Chief Steve Settingsguard is going to start. We've learned quite a bit in the last uh, year and a half since we first launched this strategy. We've um, learned some things operationally f inside the police department and how we manage the strategy. Uh, we've learned uh, we've learned from some mistakes, quite frankly, and, and learned from six successes. Um, one of the things that we we are altering our system, and we've learned this uh, and been and been taught this by John Jay College in New York is that our, we had too long of a time frame between our first call-in and our second, and that uh, we need to schedule those on a regular routine. Going into 2013, those will be scheduled uh, three or four a year. So there's going to be a three, maybe maximum four-month span between each call-in. We've gotten more efficient. At the, our second call-in was more efficient than our first was as far as the operation goes. Um, and we've learned a little bit about how to interact with some of those individuals that were brought in and, and how the process actually operates. Yeah, if I could add, I think probably from the standpoint of communication, State Attorney Jerry Brady. Um, probably what lacks is the message being reinforced to the individuals that are out there that are committing the violent gun acts so that more communication is necessary so that the message is reinforced and so that those individuals that are likely or potentially gonna commit crime recognize there are consequences if they do. So I think that's probably from my standpoint, the one uh, area that I feel is probably most lacking is continued communication. And also I think we need to recognize that when we do communicate, we need to be able to determine whether or not we're actually reaching those individuals because that's, I think, they, that's important because if it's a hollow communication and it doesn't reach them, then the consequence is also failed. You have a, you have a follow-up question? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Uh, do each one of you want to respond to this? No? 
Okay. Mayor mine, mine is short. Uh, to dovetail on the communication piece, and the other part of the communication uh, that we have uh, acknowledged that we need to get is just out to the general public in terms of our uh, what our numbers or what our monthly numbers are and how we're uh, achieving successes in that uh, space as well. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a communication not uh, only to the uh, the people that are, cr are committing the crimes, but also to the general public so they understand uh, success or failure. That end, we'll start with Nick Blahos Thanks. for the next question. Thanks very much, Tanya. The, this question's for uh, State's Attorney Brady and for District Attorney Lewis. Um, how has the prosecution at the state and the federal levels for gun crimes changed as a result of last year's Don't Shoot efforts? Well, I think one of the things that we've looked at is we've looked at the uh, conspiracy with uh, gang members. Uh, that was an area that we have initiated uh, that wasn't initiated before. It's a specific charge that uh, to say it was never charged uh, may or may not be accurate. It was rarely used. I think probably would, would be the best way to describe it. And, it. and it includes members of gangs who are in possession of firearms. Uh, the sentence then takes it from uh, a class four felony up to a class two felony that's non-probationable. Also say something that fits into the whole picture. The goal behind this is something called focused deterrence. And what that means is that you focus on the key sources of the violence in your community. Um, and, and I really appreciate the fact that the people in Peoria have said this is something we want to focus on and I appreciate that we got to talk about don't shoot on WCBU a while ago. So you focus on the people that are actually picking up the guns and shooting. Meanwhile, you try to reach out, remember focus deterrence. You focus the law enforcement on that and then you seek to deter anyone else by simply talking to them and saying to them, look, if you pick up the guns and shoot people, you're going to be facing law enforcement. And if you don't pick up the guns, if you put the guns down, you're not going to be a focus. In truth, I recommend again to everybody, read the book, Don't Shoot. You will find that the goal is to focus on a few and to have everybody else live peacefully fewer people actually being prosecuted, fewer people ending up in the prison system because we've talked to them, we've engaged with them, and we have successfully deterred people. So we're asking in the whole community, we're asking the people that are influential with gang, pe with gang members, group members that might pick up guns or help with guns, we're asking Please talk to your families, please talk to whoever might be involved in that, and try to pull them away from trouble. Reduce law enforcement. And that's exactly what's happened in community after community that has tried this particular method. You end up with fewer people in trouble with the law because people have gotten the message. And those people that won't get the message they do end up in trouble with the law. I have a follow-up question to that. At the last call-in, there were pictures posted around the room of people who are now inside the legal system processing through. Um, I don't know for sure if those are people who might be in addition to the people who would normally be part of the circuit and federal caseload or not, but speak to whether they are or not and how the, how the legal system, how the judicial system is uh, poised to handle that. Because if, if you're prosecuting more people as a result of this initial call to don't shoot, you, you ask the people uh, who might be carrying guns to lay down their guns, and then you promise if they don't, right, you will prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. So under that concept, you can anticipate that there will initially be quite a few people prosecuted, I would oh. assume. So can you speak to that? No, well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. At the first call-in, 
there were people that were believed to be, based on police intelligence, connected to about six groups in town. We, at that point, there already had been a substantial effort against the seventh group, the bomb squad. Of those six groups that we talked to about a year ago, five of those groups have not identified themselves as picking up guns and shooting. That's a success. There is one of the six groups that did, for whatever reason, and they are the focus of the indictment that was issued uh, approximately a month ago. So the truth for the community in Peoria is one group, after the discussion, after being warned, after we made an attempt to deter them, one group did not get the message, but five groups appear so far to have generally gotten the message. Frankly, we would have hoped that all six would have gotten the message, but that's not how it works. Uh, sometimes there are some people who just don't get the message. Thank you. But if people will get the message, there will be fewer people headed into the prison system. Attorney Brady, do you want to address that? Yeah, I think. I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the intelligence was gathered, the intelligence identified the individuals that were committing the, the crimes. Reports were reviewed, um, and with those reports being reviewed, we then identified individuals that uh, were typically going to be found to have guns and have guns with them, and then that uh, sadly took its course. I mean, I think that's uh, an example would have been the last call in and an individual that uh, left three hours after that and wasn't fortunate enough to recognize that there was going to be consequence. He was the first individual in recent time that was then charged with the gang member uh, weapons charge. Chief Settings Guard. And if I could add, you know, I think it's important, too, to realize that, you know, <clears throat> part of this is consequence-driven, and that's why the communication phase is so important. We need to identify whether or not our message is being received and recognized, because if it's not, then the consequence fails. There has to be a recognition. There will be consequence with the behavior. Chief, do you want to you address this? Yeah, I just want to add quickly that I think something that is unique and, and odd and unusual about about this don't shoot strategy and focus deterrence as, as a general term is it is it's one of the few if not the only law enforcement effort that crosses state local federal boundaries whose end result and end goal is to actually have fewer people arrested convicted and imprisoned that there may be at the front end to go back to your question there be may be at the front end additional prosecutions and additional arrests that have to occur to send that message that it's serious, but, but down the line at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is that we have fewer people in prison because we have fewer people shot and we have fewer young men running with guns and firing guns at one another that results in, in less damage to the community on both ends, both fewer victims and fewer young men going to prison for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, because they made that mistake. You know, if I could, I, and I think that's really the, the major beauty or benefit of this is when you talk about the criminal justice system and you talk about, you know, the theories, one is retribution, revenge, rehabilitation, focused deterrence, as the chief points out, that's the one concept that is proactive from the front end rather than, re rather than after a person has committed a crime. If we can deter people and we recognize 50% uh, recidivism is out there, clearly that is necessary. Marshanna Hester has the next question. Um, this question may be posed to uh, Peoria Mayor Jim Artis, possibly, and Police Chief Steve Settingsgard. Uh, the way I understand it is that there is a professor at the University of Illinois Springfield who has been hired to work with the task force to kind of measure the metrics of, of the Don't Shoot program. Has he, over the, since the 15 months this has been in effect, given you guys any indication of um, how successful this program has been or if uh, he submitted any type of report or when we should expect something from him? I'm not aware of uh, the work that he's doing. I don't. I don't know that I've. No. I don't know that we're aware that he was doing that. 
Okay. Is we, there any? We don't have a relationship with anyone in Springfield. Oh. Um, we have we have begun talks with Illinois Central College about doing that tracking and, and performing those metrics analysis for us, and they may end up being a partner of ours. We're already tracking data. We'll end up bringing in an, bringing in a partner to analyze that data with us and and to establish those metrics for us. Would you be able to, at this point, kind of give us where we are compared to other cities who have undertaken this initiative? Uh, I have a, a publication from the National Network for Safe Communities, and they talk about Boston and Indianapolis. I probably ought to give it to you. It's got a lot of data. And this is U.S. About, Attorney about Jim Lewis as well. Hmm? I was just introducing yourself in case folks on listening were oh, curious sure. Jim, as to who you Jim are. Jim Lewis. And then, you know, the police chief has... In, you know, statistics that he has put out to the public, and we probably ought to put out more. And uh, maybe we should put this national network statistic information out there, too. Uh, but they've had uh, a lot of success in a lot of places. This is the predominant strategy right now. It's being used in Detroit. It's being used in Connecticut. It's being used in Chicago. In the neighborhoods where it's being used in Chicago, uh, gun violence is down. In other neighborhoods, it isn't down. Uh, it's, it's a pretty well-proven strategy. And are we kind of at the point where we should be, I guess, maybe where some of these other cities were in the first 15 months? Is that what that data kind of explains there, or would you be able to flesh that out a little bit at all? There are some indicators in the local data that things are better, things like shots fired, which is, uh, if you're looking at gun violence, you kind of want to know about shots fired. Um, so there are some good indicators in, in this area. But, you know, it's, it's much too early to say that we've gotten all the results that we want to get. I'll tell you when we have all the results is when every single group that we talk to is smart and does put down the guns and when their families and the influential people in their lives tell them, no, no, you've got to stay out of trouble. Once that happens and the prosecutions for gun crimes go way down, that's my definition of success. You know, I think I would, <clears throat> I think the chief has the statistics that probably at this juncture, I think probably would be best served to be presented. Chief? Uh, I can give you a general crime uh, picture and then a gun crime picture. On the general crime front, violent crime in the city of Peoria year to date through October is down 11 percent. And that includes crimes of murder, criminal sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault. Your gun crimes will be contained in those, in those crimes against persons. Property crime in the city is down 10 percent. Burglaries, thefts, motor vehicle thefts, arsons. Oh, the overall crime rate in the city is down 10% thus far this year. On the gun crime front, the number of people shot in the city of Peoria, those that are shot with, struck by a bullet, is down 5% this year. The number of calls to 911 for shots being fired in our city is down 24%. Aggravated batteries with a firearm are down 1.5%. Armed robberies with a firearm are down 14%. Felon in possession of a firearm is up by 15%. And that's the one category we kind of want to see up. It means we're, we're focusing law enforcement attention on the right individuals, those that are running the streets with the guns, making smart traffic stops, smart field interview stops, getting those guns off the street. Our aggravated discharge of a firearm cases are down 40%. Our reckless discharge of a firearm cases are down 25 percent. The one, the one gunfire statistic that's up is homicide. Our homicides are up 33 percent, but the number of people shot are fewer. And, and we've talked about it, we've talked about it at length that when someone's shot, someone's trying to kill them. And, and whether they die or not from, as a result of that wound is not really indicative of whether or not we're more violent. The number of people shot is very indicative. The number of shots being fired in the city, very indicative. The number of people being shot at. And those numbers are all moving down. Our audience has been uh, great so far. 
in pinning out questions to get to us. We're going to have Nick Blahos ask one more question, and then we're going to do our best to get to every question that's asked here, just by way of keeping you guys informed of what's taking place. Okay. Thanks very much, Tanya. Uh, this question's for Mayor Artis. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, has the Don't Shoot program lived within its budget at this point, and what exactly has been spent? Well, I don't have um, uh, specifics. I'll say that for the most part, this program started with no, uh, no dollars. Uh, we had some generous contributions from uh, um, businesses within the community, some actual hard dollars and some in kind, like our friends at Symantle set up the uh, set up the website, uh, a lot of the marketing materials that were done were done by Symantle. A lot of those were, were basically donated to this. Uh, we did raise money to pay for some of the hard costs involved with uh, the, uh, the video uh, and also the, uh, the billboard stuff. Uh, Adams Outdoor donated a lot of the video or the, a lot of the billboard space. Uh, there's some dollars that the chief can probably speak a uh, closer number, uh, maybe that uh, in terms of uh, his department, we didn't, we didn't add or lose anybody in the, in the police department because of this. It was a reorganization of the department, which he can talk to. Uh, so in terms of, of hard dollars that were dedicated specifically to uh, don't shoot, it's a minimal number. Uh, and I don't, I don't, whatever that number is, I, I can get it for you, but I don't have it tonight. Chief, do you have any specific hard numbers about any of that? Well, I, I touch on what the mayor said. I mean, we started with no budget. We started with no money. And, and really, just everybody came to the table with, with the budgets they already had in place and the staff they had in place and dedicated their staff to the, to the mission. The only, the only added staff position that the police department has seen as a result of Don't Shoot, we've added no police officers for Don't Shoot. We've refocused some of our resources to focus on this. Um, we've added Krista Coleman's, the one single position that we increased our headcount. She was brought on board and her function is, is to work with these young men who come forward when we ask them to, to tell us that they need help. And she's the one that'll sit down and assess their needs and spend time you know, developing and identifying resources for them. So, as, I mean, the answer to the question is, other than that one position, we've been working, we've been doing this work on, on the budgets that were already appropriated. And, and I, I can't speak for the state's attorney or the U.S. attorney, but my guess is they're doing the same thing as Gentlemen, well. Gentlemen, would you characterize that as well? Oh, yeah, I, and in fact, I think it's important that we do respond to that because a failure to respond may indicate that, well, maybe there is a budget. No, our, our office, from the standpoint of the state's attorney's office, there's absolutely no change. Uh, there are two assistants that are primarily focused on don't shoot along with myself, but there's no change at all uh, in the budget. No additional money was spent. And from our point of view, this is work that we should be doing. So we're, we're happy to do it and we're privileged to work with the good people that we work with. I do want to make two points for your audience. Saving lives. That's actually a big saving. Uh, you're saving medical care, you're saving all sorts of things. Uh, saving money, uh, because you're people, fewer people ending up in, in prison. And, uh, it, and the goal, actually, is that the, the law enforcement won't have to work on as many gun crimes if we get the message successfully across. This is one of these things that saves everything, saves lives, saves money. Clear up some confusion that at least uh, one member of our audience seems to have, and it, it may help to give some clarification overall. Um, the question is, are people being arrested because they have a gun on them and are not licensed to have one, or are they being arrested for uh, associating with a group that is known to have guns? I think that's an easy question. With, you know, with the uh, Aguilar decision as well as the uh, Madison and Moore decision uh, with the Second Amendment, there's a group of individuals that fall outside that entitlement under the Second Amendment, and those are the individuals that are being arrested. Typically, they're felons or they're on probation or they're on parole. 
um, or they're not old enough to possess a firearm because there's obviously uh, well known there's been an increase in the number of younger people that possess firearms. So the individuals that are arrested are being arrested because they fall. Uh, they are not uh, lawful for them to possess a firearm. And then add to that, if there's the additional element of them being a street gang member, then that qualifies for the class two felony. Either one of you have questions in front of you that you think might be a good time to ask? Uh, I'll, this is for State's Attorney Brady. Um, have you arrested people for a current charge that, who did not have a gun? Say that again. In other words, arrested them for, we obviously have an arrested that I'm aware of, individuals with uh, charging them with a gun offense that they don't have if, if they don't possess a firearm. If they're not in possession of No. Um, no, I mean, I, you'd have to give me some facts specific, but obviously to answer that question the way it's phrased, no. Sure. Um, over the years, the city has implemented many programs aimed at reducing crime. What makes Don't Shoot different and more likely to succeed? Peoria Mayor Jim Artis. Yeah, there's probably a, a couple good responses for this one, and, and there have been a number of programs. Probably the most recent one that was similar to this was the drug market intervention that we did a couple years ago. The biggest difference, uh, in, and uh, U.S. Attorney Lewis spoke to it at the very beginning of, of the show, was the, fo the, the focused on focused deterrence. So this, number one, uh, this program, is focused on deterring uh, gun violence in the city of Peoria. So it's not, a, it's not specific to uh, anything else other than gun violence. The second thing that's really, uh, and people are, I, I, they're not convinced yet, but the, the biggest difference from those other programs that were relatively short in duration and the Don't Shoot program is, this program is going to be in Peoria for a long time. It's been extremely successful in High Point uh, for uh, a long, long time. It's been successful in other communities for a long time. So the difference is the, the, uh, the knowledge that this is a program that this community is engaged with and that we're going to continue to use for a long time, as opposed to a, a one-time uh, intervention in some specific area. This is focused on violent gun crime. Uh, and, and taking guns off the street and people that would use them violently against our citizens. But it's also focusing our effort so people understand what we, what we want them to do is not use guns. And what we will do is help provide them alternatives to that lifestyle. We're trying to say, we don't want you going down that road. We want to help you. Do you need help with education? Do you need help with uh, drug or alcohol treatment? Do you need other type of assistance? And that's what, uh, this is hopefully a positive intervention uh, uh, and that's, and thereby focused deterrence. We want them not to do this. We don't want to put more people in prisons. Nick. Uh, this is for Chief Settings Guard. Uh, Chief, is it possible that this program poses any sort of racial profiling at all? Um, I don't think it's a, it's not an issue of racial profiling. Um, we're dealing with, we're dealing with individuals that have known criminal records, that have known histories of violence, um, and, and it's, the, that, that issue's colorblind to me. I mean, if you're pulling guns, if you're, if you're shooting individuals in the street, um, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. And, and unfortunately, most of our victims are African American males. Most of the of the dead young men that we're finding in the street, and the and the injured young men, and those that whose arms won't work again, or their legs won't work again, or they're going to spend a life in a wheelchair, are African American men. And this and predominantly the suspects that are shooting them are African American men. We don't we don't write that script, but we have to deal with that script. And and we have to deal with that reality, and we're facing that reality, and we're facing it because we care. We care that we care that they're being shot and they're lying in the curbs, and we care that they're going off to prison. Um, I, I think alternative methods of law enforcement are more are more subjected to the potential of of bias, and I'll give you one example. One one 
common and very successful way to conduct law enforcement in a high crime neighborhood is to go in with saturation patrols. The downside of a saturation patrol, and I, I use the analogy of, of years ago when, you, when one of the controversies over tuna fish was that they caught tuna fish with nets and they would catch dolphins at the same time because a net didn't discriminate between a dolphin and a tuna fish. When we go in and do a saturation patrol, we end up making traffic stops and FI stops and writing tickets for people going rolling through stop signs and stop lights and things. And we end up catching a lot of moms and dads who are going about their business who make a mistake because we have lots of law enforcement in a particular neighborhood. And, and the focus is not on the gun carrying criminals, it's on, a, it's on an area which impacts a particular community to a greater degree. So if if I'm driving home on the south side of Peoria after picking up my children from school and there's a saturation patrol in my neighborhood and I roll through the stop sign on my way home, my likelihood of getting a ticket for that increase exponentially. Don't shoot doesn't focus on a neighborhood. It doesn't focus on an area. It focuses on those young men who have already demonstrated that they are, have a proclivity to violence and a, and a, and a serious arrest record. So we're paying attention to the right people, not paying attention to neighborhoods and communities. Many of the people who live there happen to live, just happen to live there, but, but when you flood a neighborhood with police, you increase the, the odds that you're going to have negative interaction between regular folks and the police just by the mere fact that there are so many police in that area. That's Go ahead. Well, if I could too. State's supplement. Attorney Jerry Brady. Uh, with that, statistics uh, which we found in, in uh, Dick County supports that. You know, these areas where the violent gun crime, that's approximately 20% of the population. Those that are possessing those firearms represent 5% of the 20% of the 100%, which we talked about before. That's why there is a 15% or three times as many uh, individuals that are that are not uh, that are not possessing firearms, not committing gun violence, and so those individuals are the individuals that we seek to protect. And that's why, as the chief points out, it's saturation or hotspot policing. That saturates. Well, the criminals then go underground, and what's left are the law-abiding citizens that are living in a poverty circumstance, who typically then have a police presence. And that's why it's so critical that we focus just on the individuals with the gun violence. I, you've asked a very good question, or a member of the audience asked a very good audience. question Indeed. through you. And I, I'm going to suggest that people read David Kennedy's book, because about halfway through, he starts to deal with the issue of race that has been such a difficult issue for this country for well almost 400 years. Um, and he says that actually in a variety of ways, this effort focusing just simply on the gun violence within a particular neighborhood or community and protecting everyone else in that neighborhood and community and uh, protecting young men who might be the victims of the violence, et cetera, leads actually to racial reconciliation. Uh, and that's why you've got to read the book and, and get an understanding of why he says that's true. And uh, I, I think he's absolutely right. I would like to see communities in which the young men who might be tempted to pick up guns and shoot each other don't do that. And that's better for the entire neighborhood the entire town, et cetera. And once that's generally understood and generally established, guess what? It's not about race. It's simply about let's not shoot each other. Nate, Terry, you have something you would like to contribute? I wanted to interject with that because I wanted to say that uh, when I lived a life of crime and when I, was, when I was carrying guns on the street and using guns, the laws and the enforcement affected me only if I put myself in that position. If I didn't put myself in that position, then the law enforcement didn't affect my life. And so once I got out of that position, 
then the law still remained, but it didn't affect me because I wasn't putting myself in that place. But as long as I would have continued to put myself in that place, then it, directed, it directly affected me because I was in that position. But as long as I wasn't in that position, then it didn't affect me at all. And so it's the same thing today. If you put yourself in that position, then it affects you. Because I have young sons that are young black men, but that law doesn't affect them because they're not in that position. And so that's important to understand. Yes, and this question will most likely be directed to you, Krista Coleman, who is the uh, community coordinator for the Don't Shoot program. I think we've got a lot of questions, I think, from, submitted from the uh, gallery here about this. Um, this question in particular is, I thought the Don't Shoot program did more than just talk. I thought it included social services, programs, job training, drug addiction help, et cetera. Um, is Peoria doing this? Can you uh, speak to that, Krista? Of course I can. Yes, we are definitely doing that. And in fact, we've had almost 100 individuals step forward and request assistance. Now, it does um, take those individuals have to do a lot of the work on their own. They have to be willing and open to accept the services that are available in our community. But I have made myself over 200 referrals to various agencies and organizations in the community for various services such as GED remediation, uh, employment opportunities, uh, substance abuse, mental health, counseling, uh, transportation, housing, and so on. And I spoke with you not too long after the second Don't Shoot call in in October, and uh, there were additional uh, maybe about uh, six people, I believe, two who are a part of the call-in and then four of their family members. Is there, I don't know if you probably, I know you can't give us names, but is there any success stories that you would just be able to share with the folks to know that these men, these gentlemen are going through this program and are trying to get to that point to change their lives? Is there any of that for you to share? There is definitely some success stories, and, and they may be judged, um, you know, we have to, enjoy and take pride in our small successes as well. And sometimes that might be getting somebody out of an uh, area where they don't feel safe and getting them to a place where they do, which we've done that for individuals. We have had um, ex-offenders who've re requested assistance receive and obtain employment actually through some of the community service providers um, that are also collaborating with us. And uh, a lot of individuals are just beginning to look at uh, a future different. They're learning to see um, that education is an option, that employment is an option, that there are services and there are people in the community that are willing to help them, but they do have to step forward and ask for the help and do the work to get there. Yes, Carl Cannon. Yeah, if I could also add on the PCAV uh, question on the support, Peoria is the only community in the United States with a park district leading a reentry effort. I mean, and it's a significant effort because it's not just getting men and women an entry-level job. It's giving, getting them those jobs with the ability to keep them, excel in them, and then move, um, and move forward in them. And you know, it's this group that has put that effort and strengthened that effort so that we're going to do more, not less. So our Peoria itself is... Unique. Tell me what PCAV is. Chris is going to explain PCAV to you. <laughs> uh, the community component of Don't Shoot is the Peoria Community Against Violence, acronym being PCAV. We've modeled this after High Point, North Carolina, who's been doing this for over 20 years. And it's a collaboration of various social service agencies, neighborhood associations, faith-based organizations, volunteers, civic organizations, and basically anyone from the community who has a desire to support and um, assist in the various components of making Peoria a safer community for all. And right now that focuses on with Don't Shoot. Thank you. Nick or Tanya? I'm trying to follow the, the, the writing here. Media states the first group has been watched, making themselves seen since 2008. Is it possible that most of these young men were wanting, asking for help? I interpret the question a little bit. I suspect the question is about 
the young men who are in question, their actual behavior? Does their actual behavior not say that they need and want help? And Krista, I, th I, think, I think you're in a role probably to speak to that best. I, I think that many of the young men, and I, I, I was not in their shoes, I do not um, know exactly where they're coming from from that standpoint. But yes, it could be a cry for help or requesting assistance, but there it is unfortunate that many individuals do not know about the services and resources available in the community and what works best for them and what uh, different organizations offer and uh, the extent of what they offer and how to best navigate through those services and resources. Absolutely. To that end, the marketing of the program you guys are getting ready, the Park District apparently is getting ready to put forward now. How do you, how do you hit that target market group with that information? Well, uh, I can speak somewhat to that. We're about to unveil a new concept that this group has put together. Um, don't shoot is an intervention. We as a, a team asked John Jay uh, the question, what did they have by way of prevention, by way of getting to them while they're sooner, younger? And there really wasn't a lot out there, so we've come up with a concept. It's called Don't Start. And we will unveil it uh, in about a week or two. We're working the details out with the school district. But it will be unique to this concept called Don't Shoot. We're trying to get in front, interrupt behaviors when they're even juveniles and they're in the juvenile system. We're going to try to interrupt that behavior so it doesn't, so they don't wind up in the, in the window of don't shoot. How soon do you anticipate getting that into the schools? Uh, as soon as the Christmas break ends, we go back in January, we're going to unveil that don't start. And it's going to be a positive. It's, it's addressing the majority, giving them positive options while dealing with those who might be in that 5% category who are, have the same profile as those who came before them, except we're identifying that and we're trying to interrupt that. Okay, so David Kennedy last year, he remarked that it was very important that the entire community buy into the Don't Shoot program. One year later, has the entire city of Peoria bought in? Why or why not? Chief Settings Guard will answer first. I'll start. I think I think it is important, but I think it's going to take time. You know, one of the one of the first questions that was asked is kind of indicative of why it takes time. And that and that question was, we've seen other strategies, we've seen other programs, and they come and go. And why is this one different? And I think that's indicative of of a wait and see mentality. That that's not surprising. And and I think it's going to take time to demonstrate that it's different. It's going to take time to prove to the community that we're that we're honest about what we're saying, that we are going to deliver what we say we will deliver, that we fully anticipate that our violent crime is going to drop, that we're going to have fewer dead young men and we're going to have fewer men going to prison. And I think as we as we move through this, and we're still in the early stages at a year and a half, we're going to have more and more evidence to show that, to demonstrate that, so that it's not just talk and that it can be felt in the community. And it, it, all, a number of things we've talked about tonight, as Jim Lewis, uh, have kind of pointed out that we're trying to get even more support within the community. That's why that explains PCAV. That explains uh, don't start, which is aimed at people who might otherwise be starting. Uh, that also explains the call-ins that we're going to do more regularly in order to, to reach the hardest group of all, which is the people that have been, you know, related to causing the trouble, uh, et cetera. So there's a number of things being done to strengthen it in the community. Uh, will, it, will it prevail? I'm absolutely convinced that it will. Uh, you have very good people here pulling together and it makes so much sense. If you say to people, would you like a safer community with fewer gunshots flying around? 
everybody's going to answer that question, yes. Uh, do you want fewer young people hit by bullets? Yes. Fewer people going to the hospitals? Yes. Fewer people in trouble with the law? Yes. So it is going to prevail, but we have to continue working until people thoroughly, thoroughly understand it. I want to go back to your cry for help question. If, you're, if the form of your cry for help is that you pick up a gun and shoot someone, there has to be a consequence that comes with that. So when you see people that want to make a cry for help, please help them before they pick up the gun and before they shoot someone. To that end, there are a group of people in the audience right now. Uh, uh, Parents in Motion is the name of the group. Their mission is to be a driving force and voice for the children in the community by helping to promote fair treatment. This is a statement from them in which I will attempt to paraphrase a little bit. To create a lasting positive change in their lives and to build strong, healthy, and safe community, uh, a community full of opportunities and hope. Parents in Motion consist of a group of parents and family members of the victims affected by the Don't Shoot initiative, concerned residents of the community and local church leaders in the community. We've joined together to prevent future wrongful incarcerations of African American males, uh, to stop police brutality and harassment of innocent children, and to eliminate gang activities, gun violence, and drug abuse in our communities. Um, the group tends to believe, I'm skipping down now to the last paragraph, the group tends to believe that the don't shoot concept is not working and is causing more chaos for the community. As a result, they're asking to join forces uh, with the U.S. Attorney General, Eric Holder, Mayor Jim Artis, U.S. Attorney Jim Lewis, State's Attorney Jerry Brady, Police Chief Steve Settings Guard, pretty much all of you guys right here, and the Sheriff, uh, Peoria County Sheriff Mike McCoy, the Don't Shoot Task Force, and other city officials, church leaders, and all of the social service groups affiliated with the community to promote positive programs and initiatives that will eradicate the safety concerns, gang violence, gun violence, and drug abuse issues in the community. It would seem that this group wants to join forces with what you're aiming to do. Um, speak to the concern, though, that this group of people obviously feels that there's more chaos being caused by this than aid and assistance. Because it, it may well be that the aid and assistance part of this, the vast majority of that aid and assistance part of this program is coming, is, is still to be coming um, in its full force, right? But, but you guys yeah, may. Yeah, you know, it, the, that circumstance being a lawyer, um, you know, the word chaos, that's a conclusion. That doesn't give me a descriptive that I can identify. In other words, the chaos is defined as such and such an event. Then it becomes something that you can discuss and you can agree or disagree with. But the, the conclusion chaos, you know, leaves me in a circumstance where you, you really can't respond yes or no. Um, I don't see chaos, frankly, but again, now I'm talking in a conclusion. So. To respond to that issue, I think it's difficult without some identification of what the chaos is. Well, uh, is it you know uh, is it is it more arrests? Um, well, thus far, you know, at least from the standpoint of the state, you know, we've got approximately 50 arrests that were addressed at the gun violence. 31 of those have been resolved. They were resolved with convictions. So either those individuals pled guilty or they were found guilty, which is indicative to me that they were also criminally responsible. So, um, you know, I need a measurement if you're going to define chaos. And the, the sheriff, who's not here tonight, says something very often when we have a press conference, uh, and he's asked this question. He says, you know, a number of people who pulled the trigger on guns are in the county jail. Now, in my mind, that reduces chaos because the people that are causing the chaos by shooting are in the jail. So I, I think actually this is intended to, as I've said before, to reduce shooting, reduce chaos, and make the community safer. And the title, uh, I love it, parents, we want you. 
I mean, I'm in two uh, Southside schools right now. We're about to un also go into four area high schools in January. Yeah, we want parents. That's the missing link. So absolutely, the things that you are against in, the, in, in your mission statement, we're against them too. So join us, get on the ground, and you tell those shorties how to, what not to do and what to do. Same thing our neighbors told us when we were younger. We need that, so we welcome that. And that door is open over here. Maybe this is a good time to add one more comment to this to this piece, and, and Carl alluded to to that part is the parental involvement in the community. Uh, this this group is uh, we're not saying that the only answer to these issues that we're facing is don't shoot. Okay, we support any community initiative uh, that that it has. Uh, their motivation to make it a safer community and, and all the things that they mentioned. Um, you know, I, I just want to call out, uh, we have a couple of council members here, Councilwoman Akison is with us and Councilwoman Moore is with us. And I want to call out specifically Councilwoman uh, Moore who has had a couple different forums in the first district over the last uh, 45 days or so. And, and why I want to call that out is not just because she had it, but because she put the focus on, we want to discuss these issues that are important to us. We know there's some dangerous areas out there. And we want you to come forward to help us be part of the solution. It, they, they weren't forums to get up there and say what's bad with everything. And I think that's really important because it's really easy for us to say, say this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this doesn't work. And, and we're acknowledging that, that we're still working through this and there's, there's things that we can improve upon and there's things as a community we can do better. And we're not saying we're the smartest people in the world on everything. So what, what, what Councilman Moore is saying, let's talk about this. We want your input. We want you to engage with us in the community, but we want your ideas. What, what do you think we can do to help? And if, and if Parents in Motion uh, is a group that can potentially help in some of those areas, we welcome that. To that end, Chief, there is the Community Policing Committee, and I may not be using the correct terminology on what the group is called, but there are representatives in the community that meet with the Peoria Police Department uh, to be that representative voice. Uh, when are those meetings? Because you, you post those, those are posted meetings, and it, it may be worth it for members of this group to attend those meetings, right? It, the, it is called the Police Community Relations Committee. They, we meet monthly. Um, those dates are published, and, and generally speaking, we don't get anyone that, that attends just to watch. But um, it is a public meeting. It is a public can. meeting. The door is open. We've had a couple of people show up now and then, but generally speaking, there's no one in the room other than the committee members. Is this an opportunity for people to maybe make an effort to work with the Peoria Police Department to better the Don't Shoot program or to make sure that, that their voice is heard in that process. Is that a place maybe that that could happen? Yeah, if I could say one, in, in terms of criticism, you know, we welcome, because the only way that we're going to improve is, and I, and I think most of us recognize there was a communication issue that possibly we needed, as the chief pointed out, we need to address a call in more frequently. That's gonna then create hopefully better communication. Um, but the groups that have comment that wish to present those comments, I think we welcome those. I mean, I think everybody wishes to improve if there's a deficiency, uh, how we can do it. Everybody here wants a safe community. Sure, sure, sure. Nick, you have a question? Actually, it's a question from one of uh, the people in our audience, and it's for Chief Settings Guard. Uh, Steve, how can you determine that violent crime percentages are down as a direct result of don't shoot? I can't. I mean, the honest, the honest answer is I can't draw a direct correlation. Um, and we're, we're too early in, and, you know, these are early numbers. It's an early, it's an early strategy, the, the crime numbers are, are early that are coming back. This is going to take time to draw a direct correlation between those two things. I believe they're related. I hope they're related. I believe that us focusing on the most, ga most violent individuals in the community is having an impact on the violence. I believe that us... Uh, impacting gang members that are carrying the guns, particularly, particularly the shooters that are running the streets. And not all gang members are shooters. 
but, but focusing on the worst of, of that worst group is paying benefits. I, I can't prove it. That's going to be part of the statistical analysis that's going to come later. Marciana, do you have a question? Um, I do have a question. Um, I guess going back to the whole shots fired thing, this isn't one of the uh, submitted questions, but one that we had earlier. The city just did a live test of the shot spotter um, that was on Tuesday, was, is that correct? Um, can you explain how this will aid in the don't shoot program and why spend the time and technology and the money to get this piece of equipment? Well, we see, we see shot spotter isn't directly related to don't shoot, but it but it supports what we're trying to do with Don't Shoot. Um, both of those things, while they work relatively separately, are designed to reduce the gun violence. Um, Shot Spotter is a, is a, uh, a system of, of listening devices that hear gunfire. They report the gunfire back to the police and they give us a much better location. And I'll give you a real life example that just occurred the other night. Um, there was a 911 call that came in from a woman who said that she heard six gunshots at Gwynn and MacArthur. Police were dispatched. At about the same time, a shot spotter alert came in that said there were eight, actually eight gunshots, and they were inside the village green complex and, and gave us the location um, on the map, on a photograph of where in the village green they came from. When we went to that spot, Within 10 feet of where the dot on the map was, we found the eight shell casings that matched the eight gunshots that ShotSpotter said occurred. If it were not for ShotSpotter, we would have had to go on the 911 call and the woman who heard the shots who thought they came from the area of MacArthur and Gwynn, we would not have found those shell casings. Those shell casings are, are inventoried as evidence. They may at some point down the road become useful in connecting a shooter with a particular crime. So they're, and they're also a deterrent factor. We want, we want them to help deter the discharge of firearms in the city because people learn that shot spotter is in place, that even if no one calls 911, we still know that it occurred, and it may save lives. An officer, take that, take that MacArthur Gwynn scenario. Let's, let's say someone was shot in Village Green and they're laying in the back of a building where we found the casings. Officers will search and search and search at MacArthur and Gwynn because that's where the witness thinks the gunfire was. And they'll search in a radius of that, but they're not gonna search two blocks away where we actually found the shooting evidence. Those officers may have found a human being laying in the grass there bleeding to death and been able to save them as a result of the technology that told us exactly where the shots were. And, and that supports what we're trying to do with Don't Shoot. Peoria, Mayor, Jim Artis. And, that was a real, and that's a perfect explanation, but I think it's, it's important also for people to understand when they say, why spend the money on that? In, in, in exactly that situation, if, if someone would have been shot and we wouldn't have found them. But we have, we spend an enormous amount of, of our resources looking for this and you know we could have realistically had you know sometimes four six eight officers coming to the scene to help try to find out where that happened and when that happens they're not out in their district patrolling their district and, and responding to crime and and the i can tell you that when when we have the ability after the shot spotter has been here the shot spotter system is going to pay for itself easily because we're, our officers are going to be out in their in their areas patrolling the city, not walking around with flashlights trying to see if they can if they can find find shells, spent shells. It's it's going to pay for itself. Yes. This is an important question. I think people can read the book. Um, People can attend meetings like these, and clearly there are a number of people here who apparently have some concerns about the direction that this program is going or what the program means overall. Um, what can the average citizen, the people in this audience, do to get involved in this effort? If they don't like the direction it's going, fair enough, this is America, do something about it. What can they do? What do you see that they can do? They can get on board. This is Carl Keenan. It's like the group Parents in Motion. 
we have a place for you. You, you have the right idea. You know, let's sit at the table, leave that table with a consensus. Carl, what is Parents in Motion? Uh, the group that you mentioned earlier. Okay. Yeah. That's, the, that's who we need. <laughs> sorry, we, sorry. we need more parents. We need grandparents. We need neighbors. We need uh, councils, coach, business owners. Um, the question was asked earlier about how much this is costing. Well, a week or so ago, the attorney general was here. And this panel had a chance to discuss what we're doing here in Peoria. But what our community should know is this panel didn't ask for money for more police officers. We didn't ask for funding for, you know, a bigger jail. We asked for prevention dollars. We need to get help the school district. We need to help the park district. We need to take advantage of those resources that are designed to keep them out instead of what we're doing so much of keeping them in. And the Attorney General even spoke to that. He said they're spending billions of dollars on locking. Let's take that money back away from the prisons and put it back in the schools and back in our community. So to that end, the book talks about the moral voice of the community. Strikes me that there are many people sitting in this room who may actually be part of that, the moral voice of the community. People who are here tonight wouldn't be here if they didn't care, if they didn't care. So let's address that. Nate, Terry. Yes, I just wanted to say that it was uh, definitely important that in the community that they get involved because it was a resource that helped me to change my life and the direction of my life, and it happened to be church. Church was the, the resource that helped direct and change my life. So it was someone that mentored me, that took time out to show me love. You know, it wasn't law enforcement per se. Law enforcement, I had to pay the, the penalty for the crimes that I committed. That was simple. Um, but uh, it was someone that reached out in the community, church. It was a resource that reached out to me and showed me love. And it happened to be, it, it just happened to be, it was men that reached out to me and impacted my life, that changed my life. So yes, the collaboration with the community and law enforcement, yes, that's important. That's definitely important. But I think uh, individually, everybody needs to play a part, especially in the community. It's, it's definite, you know, it's necessary. So that's important. Krista Coleman. Um, yes, just to touch briefly again on the Peoria Community Against Violence and what the goal of it is. It's a citizens group. It is not run by the Peoria Police Department or the city of Peoria. Rather, this is a, a voluntary group comprised of individuals in the community that want to make change for the better, to come up with new options, new resources. We cannot have enough of them to find what works best for us. And within the Peoria Community Against Violence, we have three various components that focus on different aspects. So we have the social services and resources that specifically work with the individuals that need the help. We also have uh, street outreach and the moral voice, as you mentioned, um, to go out to the neighborhoods and to the communities and talk and say, have those discussions to find those solutions and those options and what will work. And then finally, a community restoration component to rebuild uh, various things or various focuses that individuals see that there could be a need uh, in our communities and in our neighborhoods. So there's a place for everyone in the Peoria Community Against Violence and it's how they want to support it, and what they feel they would be able to bring uh, to the group, the citizens group itself, to help make Peoria a safer place. When are those meetings going to be in? Are they going to be formal meetings? We uh, hope to, um, we have the leaders of the Peoria Community Against Violence are starting to come together, and after that, we will then make the an announcement of the official rollout of the Peoria Community Against Violence, and then we hope to host a series of open houses which allow individuals to come and hear the goals and mission of the Peoria Community Against Violence and how they, they can be a part of it, yes. How soon, how soon? Because it, it sounds to me like we've got a gap. We got a time gap. Right. Because <laughs> people are ready. Well, ready. and one thing we learned from John Jay is we have to make sure that the community component comes out correctly and we bring everyone involved that needs to be involved. And so we want to make sure that we're able to do that in an effective manner and make sure that we do it right. Um, and so we hope to have, you know, an announcement about the Peoria Community Against Violence within the next week or two. Oh. And then uh, open houses in December. Okay, thank you. Nick. Yep. 
Oh, Go ahead, Chief. Chief. You know, there's, I, get, I think you need to define when you say we, we, we don't approve of don't shoot, we don't agree with don't shoot, and this, this is probably not going to be popular, but if you, if, if, what you, if you don't approve of and don't agree with focused deterrence as a strategy, it's one thing to disagree with how we implement it, whether we're doing it properly or not. If you don't agree with it as a strategy, then I think you need to move on to something else that you do agree with and find something that you think is effective and join there and, and move that forward and do, the, do what you can do to help the community in that respect. But I, but I don't want to speak for everybody here, but we're, we're committed to focused deterrence and we're committed to doing it properly, doing it correctly, following the pattern that's been established long before we got involved and, and we're going to seek to keep doing it more efficiently and do it better and do it properly. But, but we're not going to run from it. We're not going to turn from it. We're not going to change gears and chase after some other, some other strategy or some other idea until we're convinced. We get to the point that we are absolutely convinced, no, this isn't working here. We've done it right. We've done it the best we can do, and it doesn't work. Until then, I think that we have all come together and committed that this is going to be our strategy and we're going to do everything we can to make it work. Yeah, I think maybe to add to that, it's a logic. You know, people talk about it, it's been characterized as a program, and, but, but it's a, yeah, so it's a logic. The logic of human behavior is what focused dis deterrence is built upon. And then the people around it, which is why the people are so important, they're the ones that implement it. But the program and the logic doesn't fail. It's the people around it that can fail. Do you have a question? Uh, maybe that's a little bit allied with my question. Uh, is there any kind of a sunset provision on don't shoot? I mean, is this going to be infinite? Or, or is there any, when, or, when can we gauge success and how long must it go on to, to get to that point, I guess? This has been going on for a number of years, for instance, in High Point, North Carolina, and in about 14 other communities in the middle of North Carolina. And they've been doing it for about 20 years. And it happens to be very successful. The number of people killed from gunfire has gone down from about 16 a year to about four a year. People feel safer. Businesses are happy to operate in the community. It's a safer community. Uh, it's a permanent part of High Point because everybody wants to be able, if you're a grown-up, you want to be able to sleep through the night without hearing gunshots. And if you have children, you want your children to be able to play outside and you don't have to worry about them. So this is, the goal is to embed the idea that we don't shoot each other uh, throughout the community and keep it embedded as a basic value for Peoria. Anybody else want to elaborate on that a little bit? And just, you know, is this, at what point do you, how many more years do you think that something like this could be at least active in Peoria? Well, <laughs> um, I, I, maybe the, maybe this is another part of the communication people, uh, part that you're not, you, you, understanding is that we, we just started this uh, and we're nowhere near having it uh, up to the point that we expect it to be. So uh, our, I think it's our society is so uh, tuned into identifying a problem, try to say here's the solution and then expect it to be hand addressed right away. This is the complexity of what has driven not just Peoria, but what has driven our country uh, into this state of uh, violence, and in many cases with gun crime, with guns, is huge, and it's, and it's prevalent everywhere. For anyone to suppose that there's a program, in this case, Don't Shoot, that is going to address it and stop it in a year, or a year and a half, or two years, is, it's just not realistic. But the long, sustained effort of trying to help uh, these young people, in, for the most part, understand that we're not going to tolerate gun violence in Peoria. 
and over time, I believe it's going to be successful. Anybody that thinks that this was going to happen in a year is mistaken, and, and nobody else is doing it either. So this is a long-term focus, high point, 20 years. And they do, and they have had success. You know, part of the understanding of the community is when we had that uh, month of, of several shootings and a couple homicides, is the conclusion was don't shoot doesn't work. And, I, and, and it's, it's not an accurate conclusion. It's, it's, to me, it's a, it's a sign that we need to continue our efforts in that regard and continue to get that message out. That, that's a long answer. The, the short answer to your question is it's going to be a long time. It's not, it's not a program that's going to be over and claim success in a year or two years. And I, I would add that we're not in a position 18 months later of saying, well, crime is up and gun crime is up and violent crime is up, but it's just too soon to judge this. We need more time. Crime is down. Gun crime is down. We're saying we, we, can't, we can't directly say it's a result of everything we're doing, but we're saying... Well, we're seeing the numbers move in the right direction, so right. There, there's, there's, there's not no an impetus to say we need to run and change strategies, even though we're early in. One of the questions we have in front of us is where can people confirm that information? You're saying it to be true, and uh, United Press used to have, International used to have a sign up on the wall that even if your mama says it's true, you got to check your facts. So where can people, where can people, those statistics are available, I believe, on the city's website, correct? They are, and they're reported, they're reported annually, um, they're actually reported each month to the FBI under their UCR crime stats. I would just say that when crime is up and we report crime is up, nobody questions whether or not we're fudging the numbers. It's, we report the numbers, we received, we had an audit, uh, FBI UCR came in last year and audited the Peoria Police Department and we received 100% accuracy mark, which is almost unheard of. It's, most police departments are lucky if they hit in the 90s. They found absolutely zero errors in our reporting system. The crimes that we reported were accurately reported and accurately categorized. So we have about... Uh, engage with employment, engage with parenting, engage with drug abuse, engage with alcoholism, all those factors that are part of the, you know, the society that we now live in that is generational, that we have suffered for generation after generation, that portion needs to be addressed and that portion is part of the Don't Shoot program. Is it possible that trying to get the social services collaboration in place that is supposed to be the alternative, the, the assistance to help people change their behavior. It, is it possible that that could have come together sooner and may have helped some of what seems to be an, a gap being expressed by the people in this audience? I think the, the collaboration partnership uh, throughout the community social service agencies has always been there. Uh -huh. uh, most of it is done behind the scenes. Many people don't, aren't aware of how much uh, we do collaborate. The social service agencies do work together uh, to reduce the duplication of services to be able to stretch the limited funding that they do receive to affect as many and assist as many people as possible. Um, since the inception of Don't Start, we have over 50 various community social service agencies that are ready, willing, and able to help individuals who step forward and ask for the assistance and seek out the assistance and go through the process need, that they need to. But it's not also just for those young men that we discuss. Um, it's also about their families, and it's trying to address the entire uh, uh, family as well because it does affect the family. How do people get to that information? Well, and that was why I was brought on board as the community service coordinator, as being that one contact to be able to access all of those various social services and resources. That, for example, there's over eight different social service agencies that offer GED preparation, uh, assisting individuals in getting their GED, but many of them have different types of um, how they present the information, how they teach the information, how they prepare individuals to take their GED, and we have to find what works best for the individual. 
And that has to be, as uh, the social service industry says, customer driven. They have to make the choice and they have to do the work to be able to really benefit from those services and resources. We, Chief. I, I, I want to make sure that, that the discussion doesn't get off track, though, because the author has made it very clear and the, and the strategy is very clear. It's not a jobs program. It's not a strategy to fix poverty, fix racism, fix the broken education system. It doesn't fix any of those things. It really has only one very simple goal, which is why it's been successful. It's one, it's one main goal is to get young men to stop pulling triggers. And if all it does is that, if it reduces the gun violence, fewer men shot, fewer men killed, fewer men in prison, it's been a success. The, the offering of help for those men that want to come forward is a, is a bonus. And it's part of what we're trying to do. But, but if at the end of the day no men came forward and asked for help and no one received job training and no one went to GED class but fewer men were shot, I'm going to tell you that that's success for me. The, we want all the rest of it to happen, but that's not why focus deterrence exists. And to get where you can lose focus and where this can become unsuccessful is if you, if you get pulled off onto different paths and try and be all things to all people because it can't be that. Just getting the guns to stop is a huge task that is, that is taking all of this resource and all of this dedication just to get that one simple thing to happen. Roshan has a question, but I want to give you a heads up that we're getting ready to wrap up, and I'd like for you to choose a couple of you, no more than three probably, to do closing statements about where you would like for this to go from here. But first, Marciana has a question. How can community members become a part of the PCAV initiative in advance of it being unveiled? Krista Coleman. Anyone is welcome to contact me at 494-8233, and I would be happy to discuss the Peoria Community Against Violence with them and how they can be a part of it. Uh, which one of you would like to begin for closing? Peoria Police Chief Steve one of, the, one of the things we haven't talked about is is one of the values and you know what are, what it really is at the core of the strategy and what's different what what changed the day we adopted this from from how we used to do business and one of the main things that changed in the old way when when one young man shot another young man we in law enforcement would go after the shooter and and the state's attorney would prosecute the shooter. And all of the other gang members that ran with that shooter, who, who contribute to that culture, who contribute to that decay in the community, who are victimizing the community, they went free. And there were no consequences for those young men. And so one of the critical aspects of this is now when that shooter shoots someone and they die in the street, we hold that group accountable for that shooting. And they're warned in advance that we're coming. And, and they're held accountable for the crimes that they commit, not just simply for being hanging around with gang members. We pay attention to what they're doing. And it's that peer pressure that helps bring that, that violent crime rate down. And what other cities have told us is that gang members begin to police themselves. And they begin to say, we can't afford to shoot we can't afford to carry guns and continue to do what we're doing because law enforcement will pay too much attention to us. And, and that's part of the value of it. We are offering chances and we are offering, we offer help, we offer hope. We, we need to partner with the community to get this accomplished. We can't do it by ourselves. But there has to be consequences for those that are killing people in their own community. Carl Cannon, 60 seconds. We, uh, we're encouraged, not discouraged, okay? Getting in front of it, interrupting it, it has to be the ultimate goal. Don't shoot, again, I said this earlier, it's an intervention. Don't start, which we will unveil in January, will be prevention. And we're going towards the group 
that are more likely, most likely to be involved because we know the profile has been there for years, decades. So please understand this group took on Don't Shoot, but the real focus of this group is to not have to do it, you know, in a day to come in our future. Jerry Brady. Yeah, I think the, the biggest part of this is it's a proactive rather than a reactive. And, and because we are where we are now with the Don't Shoot program and, and you know, working 15 months, I think I welcome the community to get involved with PCAP. We welcome more people to get involved with PCAP because this is not going to work unless it's a community effort. Um, the beauty, as I said before, is it's a deterrence model logic. It is not a punishment model. It's meant to Crime goes down, education goes up, business can succeed, the whole community knows. Mayor Jim Artis. Thank you, and, and a quick thank you to uh, WCU and the partners that participated in this tonight, because really, this program uh, tonight started off talking about communication. And the more, uh, and we, this group has had opportunities to talk to groups all over Peoria and outside of Peoria about what we're doing here. The more we can do that, the more people understand what it is and what it isn't is really important. And I urge people to, to find that out because, like I said earlier, if, if somebody thinks that uh, if someone gets shot tonight that don't shoot doesn't work, that's, that, those dots don't connect, but you have to understand why. But outside of that, and I mean, I was frankly shocked at how many uh, people came down tonight, and I applaud everybody that did. And, and, and understand, this, this isn't the only thing that we can do. We encourage and we applaud members of the community that want to do things to engage positively. Thank you. Krista, we're going to need that number again. Your number. Right? Good yes. idea? Uh, those interested in receiving assistance uh, can call my number at 494-8233. And those interested in becoming involved in the Peoria Community Against Violence, that number again is 494-8233. And we do look forward to rolling that out. And um, we can never have too many options and services and resources in our community to make it a safer community. Who of you? All right. The Don't Shoot panelist for tonight's broadcast, Peoria Mayor Jim Artis, Peoria Police Chief Steve Settingsguard, Peoria County State's Attorney Jerry Brady, Peoria County Sheriff Mike McCoy was not able to be with us tonight. U.S. Uh, Central District Attorney Jim Lewis, Peoria's Don't Shoot Coordinator, Krista Coleman, and our community representatives, Carl Cannon and Nate Terry. Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our media panelists, Journal Star, City Hall reporter Nick Vlahos, and WEEK HOI reporter Marshanna Hester. A special thanks to Tate Chambers in the U.S. Attorney's Office, who brought the research to the community that identified the Don't Shoot program and its merits. He also works behind the scenes to make sure that the program is implemented as it's specified. Tonight's broadcast was made possible in part by Daryl Scott and Tom Hunt. Our thanks for production assistance for tonight's broadcast to Nathan Irwin, Alex Ruciano, Denise Molina, Lisa Polnitz, Jason Meeks, and Jerry King. George Bean, a Washington resident, and his family provided our video streaming, our live video streaming for tonight. Thank you to George Bean and his family for doing that. You've been listening to our live broadcast of, of the Don't Shoot Town Hall meeting for its annual community review of the Peoria program. I'm Tanya Kuntz. This is 89.9 HD1 WCBU Peoria Public Radio.